Welcome. I'm Michael Alexander, Director of Public Programming at Caltech. We're about to share with you a program that was recorded earlier last week featuring Elena Newport, one of the founders of the Capital Steps, which was a stalwart on the Caltech Live series for many, many years. She's being interviewed by Sarah Spitz. Before we go to the interview, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Caltech Employees Federal Credit Union and the Friends of Beckman Auditorium. If you'd like more information about the Friends or to be kept up to date about the performing arts, science, and authors programs that we're presenting, check out our website at events.caltech.edu. And now with a prelude from the Capital Steps repertoire, and then we'll go right into the interview. Let's welcome Elena Newport and Sarah Spitz. May I have your attention, please? Attention, please. Now, if you're a Democrat for president in 20, raise your hand, just raise your hand. Now observe this, if you will. There's some people from the Hill, and they seem to think they're qualified to run this land. Now, you've all heard of Sanders, Biden, Warren, Shore, but all of those names combined cannot compare to the electric thrill you might enjoy when Kamala Harris, New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, former HUD Secretary Julian Castro, and Hawaii Representative Tulsi Gabbard all go to Iowa on the very same historic day. 76 unknowns are the candidates with 110 more set to declare. In Des Moines every weekend morn, they're lined up like rows of corn and most just do not have a prayer. 76 unknowns on the campaign trail and most of them think that they would be great. Can Pete Buttigieg find a way to get through election day? Did you know that he's openly gay? New Hampshire will be crawling with these candidates. Pollsters watch Dixville notch like it's some special place. Some Starbucks CEO thinks he is really hot. An ego shot is making him join the race. Does it seem that every time they're starting earlier, jump the gun? A Biden run would sure be green environmentally. It would mean we'd reuse our props from 88. 76 unknowns will campaign for months. And most of these candidates aren't great. You can help up the steps for sure. When in doubt, you should vote for the funniest candidate. Well, good evening. And welcome to another Caltech special presentation, one that we're putting together during this pandemic to help stay in touch with all of you in our audience and to give opportunities for us to talk with and hear some of the art from a number of great artists who have been on our stage or some of them over the past couple of uh, months have were scheduled and got canceled because of the pandemic. But today we are in for a, a real treat for goes on, I think, close to three and a half decades, Caltech has been closing its season with the capital steps. And obviously, we have not been able to do that since March of 2020. But uh, we also were very saddened to hear that the capital steps uh, decided that this pandemic was leading them to having to decide to close their doors. But we are very lucky to have one of the co-founders and absolutely one of the creative leaders of the Capital Steps with us today, Elena Newport. And she'll let you know where she's checking in from. I'm checking in from Mount Washington in the Highland Park area of Los Angeles. And also joining us is the woman that produced the national broadcasts. And as I was talking with them earlier, when I was a kid, every artist wanted to get on Ed Sullivan's show. And for many of them, it was that introduction to the American audience that guaranteed presenters like Caltech that we would fill our houses. Well, I can't believe that there would have been any better way than the national broadcasts that uh, Sarah produced and that were distributed through NPR affiliates all over the country 
to introduce the Capital Steps intimately to a great audience and to the many, many years of touring that uh, certainly entertained us in the Los Angeles Pasadena market and that entertained audiences, uh, sometimes even in the White House, uh, to the incredible mock that they put into democracy. I'd like to turn it over to Sarah Spitz, who many of you may know was for years involved with KCRW and while there was the national producer of the Capital Steps. Sarah, why don't you start the uh, conversation with Elena Newport? Happy to do it. I, I use the word producer in quotes because basically I was kind of just setting stuff up so that the program that they produce could go up on public radio. And, and I know we, we, we mentioned this before you, uh, Elena, the steps used to be heard periodically on All Things Considered, but honest to God, I do not remember how the steps came to partner up with the station to distribute you nationwide on public radio. To be blunt, our general manager was not known for her sense of humor, so this made it a really unusual partnership. I do also remember that we had something called SAS, still another satellite service, so that we could provide alternative content to the system, and I used to joke that it was Sarah Ann Spitz's satellite, since I was handling all the technical arrangements but so we how do how did we find each other Elena do you remember my memory has gone out I'm ancient now I, I should give you a little background on all things considered because you know they were a young show and we were a young group and we didn't know but there was millions and millions of people listening to all things considered even back in the 80s and they would call us up and they would say something like do you have a song about you know Ollie North or whatever it was in the 80s that was going on and we would say Yes. <laughs> no, we didn't, but we would write one in the next two hours. <laughs> and then we would run up to, you know, National Public Radio because they're, you know, the main studios were uh, not that far from us. We're in Alexandria, Virginia, and they're up in DC. And we would record a song that we had written, like the, the ink was still wet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that got us pretty known. Um, we were amazed. People would hear us all over the country. And then I guess you heard us as a result of that and um, approached us. And we've been trying to think about how do we do a radio show? We were overwhelmed by the logistics of it. And you just said, hey, you just record it and we'll put it on our satellite and everybody will download it. And the rest, you know, the rest will be history. So um, you were just a great help to us. Yeah, but you mentioned the, the in the early days, it wasn't quite as easy as pushing a button and going up to the satellite. Right, right. We had we had reel-to-reel -reel tapes. <laughs> Just like they had on Ed Sullivan, I guess. Um, we had reel-to-reel -reel recordings. And I remember that if you, and we had to make them time out too, exactly to like 59.30. Like, and I remember that if, you know, we were like, okay, you got to do this song really fast. <laughs> <laughs> because because we're going to run out of time where you got to stretch this song out because you know we had to come in exactly at the right amount of time and then take the reel to reel tape and run up to the national public radio headquarters and send it to your satellite um and it was it was really stressful now in recent years we were able to like um make fix mistakes and things like that but back then we really couldn't <laughs> truly live <laughs> Uh, so, you know, some songs seem to suggest themselves. Barbara Ann, Bomber Ann. I heard yeah. that in my own head. I was singing it to myself. Just the title, though. You guys yeah. come up with the lyrics. How did that happen? Well, I mean, we have, well, sometimes you're right. Sometimes the song was just, you know, just out there. The, the pun was good. The rhyme was easy. We did Barbara Ann. We did, uh, you know, How Do You Solve a Problem Like Korea we used many times over the years because... Everybody knows that song, it's a good pun. Um, other times you'd have a really kind of tough subject like, or, or a tough rhyme, like, you know, in recent years we had to try to write Pete Buttigieg. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes, sometimes the, the, the pun is very obvious and then other times you just sit down and go, okay, what are we gonna do? And in that case, we wrote a song called Pete Buttigieg is the hardest rhyme because we had, <laughs> Yeah, I think we might have a clip of that one, but um, yeah, we had we had nothing <laughs> nothing to ride with Pete Buttigieg. Well, were you always funny? Were you and Bill sitting in the back room in Senator Percy's office, just kind of uh, you know smarting off? <laughs> well, you know, we thought we had serious careers on Capitol Hill when we started. Um, we 
actually thought maybe we would get fired for doing this. <laughs> so we were a little worried about that. Um, but um, no, we kind of just, we put this together for a Senate office Christmas party. We just, um, Bill had written some songs. I had been a piano major in college, which I thought was useless, but it turned out not to be useless. So I played the piano for those first shows and um, nobody told us to stop. In fact, Senator Percy, who was one of those great moderate Republicans that you don't find in the wild anymore. <laughs> he just, um, he, would, he never, he invited us to perform for him. He never told us to stop. He was very supportive. His family came to our show. They invited us to their house. So we were very lucky to work for a gracious and wonderful man like that. Over time, it was a question of, uh, it was just the original ones of you in the, in the 80s and 90s. And then how did it evolve into an expanded group? How did it evolve into a, a touring company? And one other thing, how did it evolve from just singing to the whole performance thing that you ended up concocting? Well, we, you know, we actually tried, you know, for the first few, few years we were around, we tried to do it all with Senate staffers. Like that was our shtick. And it kind of helped us. It was like it was like we were like the tap dancing cat. It was kind of weird and unusual that we were doing this thing as Senate staffers. So we got a lot of press out of that. But we um, about 15 years in, when Clinton got caught with Monica, um, we got so busy. <laughs> the show numbers exploded. And we started touring and having like multiple casts. And we had to add some Washington area performers that weren't Senate staffers. So we were a mix after that. Um, but that was funny too because. We would have uh, Washington area performers come in and audition for us. And they would, the auditions were very funny because they'd always bring like this beautiful ballad or some great song and they'd knock it out of the park and they'd sing like some and shout it evening. And then I would say, okay, now sing that like Kim Jong il would sing it. <laughs> <laughs> and this was their audition. And, and they would look at me like I was crazy, but then they would realize, you know, part way into their tenure with the Capitol Steps that they were going to have to do that. They were about to figure, what would Kim Jong-il sound like if he was singing? So. And there's a whole new Kim Jong now, so <laughs> you'd have to update yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, it looks like you want to step in here, and I should let you do that as the host. Well, not thank you, but that it, it, the question led to some other thoughts, too, because somewhere along the line, Lurdy dies uh, started up as becoming a staple of the uh, repertoire and to the point that when uh, we handed out programs at Caltech, we often included the script of Lurdy Dies. And for those of you not familiar, uh, I really should let uh, Elena tell us more about it and how it came to pass. Well, it's called Spoonerism. So you flip the words. So you say like, instead of the American way of life, you say the American lay of wife. <laughs> you flip the first letters of the words. And then it gives you very funny possibilities with extremely dirty stories can be told without saying any bad words at all, <laughs> but sound, they sound dirty. So um, the first one was about Harry Bart, Gary Hart, when he was caught with uh, Rana Dice aboard the monk, I can't even say it forwards now, Bunky Business, <laughs> that was the boat they were on. And Bill Strauss um, convinced us that this would be a funny way to present that story. He had heard some spoonerisms. Um, it's a, it was an old vaudeville routine with Cinderella, and um, it was a, it became a staple. And we did oh my goodness, I don't know how many different scandals that way because sometimes a scandal was hard to cover without getting too risque, but you could do it that way and kind of get away with it. Michael, I was just going to say audiences loved it. Yeah. it. It was one of the highlights, or the anticipated shticks that everybody came knowing that this was going to be part of the show. Ladies and gentlemen, for many years, the Capitol Steps have been poking fun at all kinds of stupid politicians, big scandals. We've seen the highs. We've definitely seen the lows. And we always ask, what could be better? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to start over, sorry. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, for Yenny Mears, the Stapital Caps have been folking pun at all kinds of skig bandles and poopit politicians. We've seen the lies. We have definitely seen the hoes. <laughs> and we always ask, but could be wetter.
just whip your flirts. <laughs> Anybody here that's a terse timer, just whip your flirts. And I promise you'll hit the gang of it, but <laughs> if you need to, you know, feel free to nibble down some scrotes. <laughs> So in the Stapital Caps, we normally make fun of the pearl of wallatics. We started back in 1981. Back then we had resident pagan who wanted us to gin one for the whipper. <laughs> then we got the original Borge Gush. Laid my rips. <laughs> then we got Clil Benton. <laughs> the man who whenever he saw a really chot hick, he would say, oh, this must be my ducky lay. <laughs> Then we got Borge Yubbledo Gush. <laughs> and Yubbledo. <laughs> Yubbledo had a QI in the Dingle Sidgets. <laughs> in 2008, we got a new Learless feeder, Resident Obama. And once again, he is our most recently erected president. Sarah, back to you. How many presidents did you spoof? And what was the experience like? Ah, well, we started um, under the Reagan administration. That was a great time for satire. Because here, you know, Ronald Reagan had come from acting to politics or from showbiz to politics. And he had a great kind of attitude about it all. I mean, we thought, well, we'll just go from politics to showbiz and kind of even it all out. But it was a fun time for satire because he brought in this whole cast of characters, Ed Meese, we did the Meeseketeers, uh, James Watt, Secretary of the Interior, and we did um, Mine Every Mountain. Uh, and he was really fun and invited us to the White House. And um, <laughs> this is great. After the show, he got up and he said, thank you, Capital Steps. Now you're all under arrest. So, you know, with perfect delivery. So he was... He was great. And the thing about that era was that, you know, he would have a beer with Tip O'Neill at the end of the day. So he was happy to laugh at a Tip O'Neill song. He was happy to laugh at a song about him. It was all good. Um, and George Bush Sr. invited us many times. He was, he loved, he invited Dana Carvey too to the White House because he just loved the humor and he loved being satirized. And he was so nice. And um, we performed for the Clintons um, several times. Al Gore's 48th birthday party, that dates us some, but um, that was fun. And um, for George Bush Jr., but only in the context of a larger event that he was invited to. So, um, and then after that, um, we did not ever perform for Obama. Um, mm -hmm. He was a little, and he was a little tougher to satirize because you know, at the time it was like, well, he has big ears. What else is there? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but pretty soon he got involved in, there, there was there was things swirling around him, issues swirling around him. So uh, we had fun with him too. And then, you know, the last four years, <laughs> that was like, a, it was moving so fast, it was almost impossible. But uh, we tried to keep up with it. Last four years that felt like a century. Uh, <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Well, I was going to say I was in the audience because I've only been at Caltech for two and a half years now, but I was in the audience early, early on. And then also the night that Michael Eisner was there when you poked fun at uh, Euro Disney. Right, right. And I was just wondering about uh, how many other uh, non-political figures got to be uh, subjects of your songs. Well, one of the fun things about Caltech is that we also got to perform many times for Richard Sherman who wrote the music for Mary Poppins and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and a lot of the Disney uh, Jungle Book and things like that. And he would come and we would love to include at least one song of his in the show that we were satirizing. And then, but, but the Eisner, Michael Eisner year, I think we went over to the Disney studios and performed that for a very select group of Disney executives <laughs> at their invitation. So they, they were good sports about it too. Elena, is Mark Russell still around? Is he still performing? I don't think he performs, but I heard from him in, within the last year or so that he's still living in DC. But, um, and of course, nobody's been performing this past year or so. Uh, yeah, there's that. Um, 
what amongst your mini songs do you think could be considered timeless material, if any? Well, um, you know, there are some issues that never go away. We, um, well, um, songs about the environment never go away. You know, songs about Congress messing up never go away. Um, so, so we have some songs. Um, we had a song called Putin on a Blitz about Vladimir Putin <laughs> that was performed shirtless, by the way. Shirtless. <laughs> Oh, that we have a clip of. And you can see that the performer does not work out. <laughs> 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 so we should play a clip of that because that's how brave our performers are, Putin on a Blitz. Um, but that song, as long as Vladimir Putin is around, we could, we could have done that song and we did it for many years and it was one of my favorites. I, I suspect he'll be around for a little lot longer too. <laughs> so you can keep pulling it out of the closet if you need to. Or else, yes. <laughs> is enough torture for you. <laughs> but once you go Cossack, you never go back. Здравствуйте! I am Russian President Vladimir Putin. And I am here to welcome myself. Now I'm sure you recently heard news that uh, many uh, Russian hackers have been planting fake news stories, eh? Yes, well, some of them are garbage. But many of them are true. And I know this for a fact, because Mr. Trump has been CCing me during all of his secret intelligence briefings. <laughs> also, I'm sure you have possibly heard that uh, recently I have been big pain in Tukus. I found this out myself as I was uh, traveling to uh, other Eastern European countries. I had to go through customs. Eh? Customs agent asks me my name. I say Vladimir Putin. He says, country of origin. I say, Russia. He says, occupation. I say, no, no, just visiting. <laughs> See, we make joke, huh? <laughs> so, then I find that your former Secretary of State, John Kerry, wishes to speak with me, eh? Well, I would have gone to meet him myself, but I was not able to make it because I got snowed in. <laughs> Brum -ching. Anywho, I digest. Now, um, I understand the U.S. people like song and dance, yes. So, I would like to now uh, perform for you old Russian folk tune. Written by me, <laughs> Vladimir Putin. <laughs> My name's Vlad, when I get mad, like in Ukraine, when there is pain, I send more shit. Putin on the blitz. US force, you must exert. This makes me take off my shirt. You say, tsk, tsk. Is a risk. <laughs> Although US and threats, I just don't see ya coming all this way to help cry me. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't want to be a every plan to stop this threat makes me jump up and scream. Yeah, when cold war heats, I gave up on my feet. Hey, we were matching weeds. Hey, Putin never quit. I put it on the blitz. Elena, uh, one other person that you and I both crossed paths with, uh, I have a funny Ross Perot story. Um, Ross Perot, as we all know, was third party candidate uh, running, uh, running against Al Gore and, and who else? Uh, <laughs> and um, he threw his own convention. And I get on the phone with him because he's going to be on one of our local programs. I say, Mr. Perot, uh, what's your convention going to be like? He goes, we're going to have an unconventional convention. <laughs> <laughs> I fell on the floor and I couldn't 
even talk after that, but what's your Ross Perot story? Oh, uh, Ross Perot, as a writer, if somebody asks me who my favorite character in the whole history of the Capitol Steps was, it would be Ross Perot, because he didn't talk like a normal person. Okay. So he would say things like, okay, this is actually a line we used. He would say, the deficit's like a rattlesnake in your pants. You know, you gotta take out your gun and shoot it, but you don't wanna hit nothing important. <laughs> so it was like, you know, he would have these folksy like at analogies and it would all be very, you know, so I just love writing. How would Ross Perot explain his position on this issue? All, all time favorite. Now, you have decided, you were the last remaining original step, right? <laughs> yeah, 39 years. <laughs> 39 steps. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, why did you call it quits because of COVID or is it just there's a point in time one ceases? It was it was a little bit of both. It was kind of like I was kind of ready to go and this kind of decided it for me. Um, but, you know, things got things got a little tougher as time went on over the last four years, we've all been through a lot of this, you know, partisan bickering and things like that. And I remember after the 16 election, um, people were not even sure whether they could come to our show because they were so upset. Mm -hmm. You know, some people on whichever side you were on, there'd been a lot of arguing at the Thanksgiving dinner table or whatever. So people would come to our show and they would say, I didn't know if I could laugh, but I did and I feel better. And that was kind of, that was good for a while. We really liked it, but it was harder and harder to sort of, for me, I'm a moderate, but it was really sort of hard for me to strike a balance when these things were going on, like the Proud Boys and the things that were so, you know, they weren't really funny. <laughs> like they were, they were hard to satirize and they were so contentious. So for a variety of reasons, I was kind of ready to go. And the COVID thing said, okay, that, that shut us down. We would have had a really busy fall in the fall of 20 because it was an election season. Oh, yeah. We had bookings like crazy. So I felt bad for the performers, but on my, for me personally, 39 years of how do I make this funny, I was kind of ready to let that go. Michael, do you have something you want to add or, or ask? Well, I was just wondering too, if you you're part of a long tradition that probably goes back to the days of a court jester that have sometimes had to use humor to bring truth to power. And uh, it, it, it's interesting to see how important the work that you did. And I think, Sarah, we owe you a big thank you as well, because you helped bring this to the national audience. And I don't know if uh, there's anything quite like you that is uh, stepping forward to, to take your place at this point. And we may have to wait a few years to find some other creatives that are gonna do something quite uh, as important and uh, as entertaining. Because uh, obviously it was Will Rogers and there was Tom Lehrer and there've been a whole slew of folks that uh, have, uh, fortunately we have recordings of there are stories about others that were doing their work before film, before television, before Thomas Edison and the phonograph. But this is a, a part of a tradition. Has that been something that you've been aware of, that of the of the continuum of where you fit into this uh, important role that I'm sure most countries need if they don't have it? Well, I'm, I'm very flattered that you put me in some of that company, and those were certainly. People that I, when I was growing up, I listened to Alan Sherman and Tom Lehrer, and I read those Mad Magazine parodies. And um, so it's, it's fun to be in that company. I don't, uh, um, I'm sure there would be lots, lots more. I mean, even now, like if you look on the stuff that just springs up or on YouTube or, you know, Randy Rainbow or all those people that kind of just turn these things around so fast, I really admire them and their, their technology is so good. And so maybe it'll change a bit. But, um, you know, I, I watch Colbert, I watch The Daily Show, I watch all those guys and those guys are great too. I actually have just one last question and uh, I could stretch it if you need me to, but I bet <laughs> you're still making up song lyrics in your head. What's you that? I bet you're still making up song lyrics in your head. Well, if I so, share. 
I have to admit that Arrivederci Cuomo came into my head when he got into a scandal recently. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how can I give that to? <laughs> That's so funny. That is so funny. All right. Well, and then I'm going to ask you one more because I lied. Okay. <laughs> it's not an original question. I read it in an interview. I thought the answer was wonderful. If you were to compare yourselves to some other kind of business, what would it be? Uh, <laughs> some other kind of business. I mean, like the circus. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know if I understand the question. Or... Uh, this you at the time. Uh, what other? What other? What else could you have been? I mean, uh, you responded at the time. We can probably edit this out. Our interests are diametrically opposed to the best interests of the country. We yeah. want things to go wrong. That's what I was getting to. So I'm going to come back and ask that question again. If you were to compare yourselves to some other kind of business, what would it be? Ah, well, see. Oh, we kind of like we're kind of like funeral directors or car repossessors because. We, we wait for something bad to happen and then we, you know, we make hay out of it. <laughs> and what hay it was. <laughs> Michael, I'm turning it back to you. Well, thank you. And I hope that you will share with as many of your colleagues that, uh, I know we've lost a few of them, but uh, those who are still around, how much they meant to our audiences. And I'm probably speaking for presenters all over the country. I know that Caltech is really feeling very fortunate that you agreed to join us today, that you're part of this conversation and that I'm so grateful that uh, in our initial conversation, you mentioned how important Sarah was to your national presence. Because uh, as I said earlier, I think that there's a, a role that is underappreciated. Probably those who have uh, insomnia and stay up after 1130 at night get a taste of it whether it's on Saturdays at Saturday Night Live or uh, five days a week on the major networks. But this is a, an important contribution. It, humor has always helped us uh, deal with uh, issues and sometimes uh, even get to the nut of an issue in a way that uh, a didactic presentation couldn't. So please extend our thanks to all of your colleagues and my personal thanks to, to you personally for taking the time to be with us today. And uh, the Caltech audience that we're going to switch to momentarily, I know they have probably got other great questions. I guess I would just ask how you stayed friendly with each other because you were <sighs> part of the real original, I, you didn't even have to truck it. It was the bus and truck type of touring, but you were, really in uh, automobiles and uh, on the ground a lot. You weren't flying maybe initially to one coast or the other, but otherwise you had to do a stream of shows. Cause I know that I talked to colleagues that the day after we had you in Pasadena, you were up in San Luis Obispo at Cal Poly and then everything else was just sequential and all in the cars. You stayed friends? Oh, I never laughed so hard as with when I was on some of those trips. I <laughs> and, and the thing was, we all had different political views. I mean, there was extreme liberals and extreme conservatives, and we, we had these discussions, but it was always in the end, we just laughed like crazy on the road. I mean, so it was a great time. It was a blast. And Caltech was a big part of that. We loved coming out there every year. Well, I know that colleagues of mine who were, have, and we have at least uh, a few who were on staff going back as far as 40 years ago. So they remember your first appearances and worked with you backstage and in the house and in publicity. And they all just were uh, so thrilled that we were a regular with you, that we played an important part at Caltech to introducing you live to the West Coast, uh, to general public audiences and all. So uh, I'm happy that uh, we are having this conversation. Sarah, did you have one more question to throw out? You had the question. You, we neglected to ask, and since we can edit this in, what about Joe Biden and the steps? Have we gotten far enough into, I mean, did you guys ever do anything with Joe Biden? We did songs about him. We never saw, we never, uh, at, that I know of, did a show for him, that we did a lot of shows where I didn't know who was out there. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, yeah, we had lots of fun with Joe Biden. Most recently, um, uh, well, we did You Can't Hide That Biden Guy while he was with Obama. And we did uh, Can You Feel the Rub of Tonight when he was, uh, you know, massaging the shoulders. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun. Joe was fun. He was, and I think he would have laughed at everything we did about him. 
Well, I've been laughing for a long time and I thank you for what you've done for me and for making me feel so honored here. You, you guys, you're legends. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for being such a big part of it. And thank you, Michael. And if there's ever a reunion tour, you guys will be the first ones I will call. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And we're now going to bring the recorded portion of this program to a close and regroup for the audience in just a matter of seconds as we open up the mics so that everybody who has a question, well, I can't say everybody, but as many as we can fit in will join us for some uh, opportunities to post some questions to Elena Newport. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Joe Biden here, right? Look, uh, you, you all know I'm running in 2020, okay? Uh, but, and, and there's a big but. <laughs> Oh, uh, wait, 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 look, I, I, I didn't mean any uh, disrespect to any of the plus-size ladies in the audience out there. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> I've got to remember, people tell me, Joe, when you get that handsy urge, you should let it go. <laughs> but I've got strong affection, that's just what I do. I might want to rub your neck or smell your new shampoo. Can you feel the rub tonight? I'm just being me. I would be the perfect president in 1953. Gender roles are shifting, of that I am well versed. I'm reaching out to everyone, just touching women first. People want to change me, but that is for the birds. I simply will remind myself, her ass is not two words. And if you feel the rub tonight, I've not thought this through I live my life by this philosophy What would you have to do? Can you feel the rub tonight? Don't want to let you go I can announce I've signed Again, congratulations on having touched America for 39 years, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Elena. I'll also just introduce our house manager. If you were coming to see the Capitol Steps or any other performances at Caltech, the front door at Beckman Auditorium opens, and there's Corrine Shore as our house manager, and we thought, who better than to welcome you and help manage your experience during this portion of the program than our own house manager. So I thank Corrine very much for always being available and for being such a gracious host to all of our guests. We're going to turn it over to you momentarily, but while we're still in the process of letting people in, I just wanna remind everybody that one way that you can keep the capital steps in your life is by buying their CDs. And Elena's informed us that they still have a few in their inventory and are sending them out to people all over the country. So Elena, do you just wanna tell everybody what they can do to uh, find out about the various uh, products that are there on your shelves? Oh yeah, well, we are, our website is still up and running. It's capsteps.com, or if you type in capitalsteps.com, it'll get you there too. Um, and we, we're still selling with 39 CDs over the years, actually one per year on average. Um, and we still have them and they're a way to look back at every scandal that happened for the last uh, 39 years. <laughs> and the page is very seductive. I went on to check it out and left spending $48. So uh, I'm waiting for them to arrive. I just ordered them a day ago, but I would encourage any of you who want to <clears throat> continue to enjoy the clever uh, spoofs and to be reminded of some of the uh, 
politics that went on over the last nearly 40 years, they're giving us a, uh, a, a, a skeptic's eye view, or not a skeptic, a cynic's eye view. They're giving us a very Washington DC eye view of everything. Corinne, I'm gonna turn it over to you to start uh, filtering out and bringing in the questions from our friends that have joined us today. And thank you all for being part of this. Great, wonderful. Hi, everyone. So this is really a chance to ask questions, but also share memories and things like that that you might have of Capital Steps. So the best way to do that is to raise your hand via the Zoom feature, which if you look at the bottom of the toolbar where it says mute and stop video, you'll see one that says reactions. If you click on reactions, it'll give you the option to raise your hand. And that way I know that you have something you'd like to say, and then I'll call on you. If you don't feel like speaking, that's fine. You can enter your question or comment into the chat as well, and we'll read them off from there. So we already have some takers. So let's start with Jane. Jane, what, what do you want to share or say? Oh, I just wanted to say thank you for all the wonderful memories my husband and i have been going to shows for decades and we always laugh even though he's a republican and i'm a liberal democrat <laughs> and i i think if if nothing else that shows exactly how both brilliant and balanced <laughs> your <laughs> routines are and my total favorites i love the timely stuff no question but uh, Lurdy dies and there's always a women's room line always no. make me laugh we have the CDs and even my children thought they were funny. Well, yeah, well, thank you for the question the thing about the balance because you know the party in power is always going to be a little funnier. So some years, if, if, you know, one party was running everything, it was kind of hard. I remember even during, you know, during the Clinton years, you had to, okay, well, there's Newt Gingrich out there, but, you know, mostly the Clintons are funny. And then it flipped, it flipped every, every few years. So uh, we, we always tried to get, um, get both sides equal opportunity offender. And I personally am a raging moderate, so I think they're <laughs> both silly. <laughs> but thank you. That's... You're welcome. Sarah, do you have a question or comment? Sarah Hyman. Comment. Um, the first time I heard there's always a woman's room line was a Friday night at Beckman. And Saturday afternoon, I was at theater at South Coast Repertory in Costa Mesa. And they had like just that year taken over the old men's room and added it to the women's room to expand the women's room. And there was still a line. And for some reason, there must have been something going on in the new men's room because they had a line. And then a couple of months later, I was up at the Utah Shakespeare Festival, waiting in line at intermission. And I went, there's always a woman's room. And like three people behind me, the girl started applauding because she knew the steps. Oh, so that's really funny. Well, yeah. You know, we used to throw that song in based on whether there was a woman's room line at the, whatever theater we were at, we would, we'd go out at intermission and we would say, okay, check the ladies room and see if there's a lot of frustrated people. And if so, we'll throw that in at the top of the second act. And, we, and sometimes we actually kind of do a little white lie and say, we just wrote it for that particular event. <laughs> <laughs> learning from politicians, learning from the best. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, um, I can say that Beckman Auditorium must have always offered you that opportunity because we <laughs> always have the lines for our women's room. That's a fact. Um, we have a question in the chat from Joe. It says, are there any songs that in retrospect you regret writing or performing? I remember hearing Help, Help, Rwanda and bursting out in laughter, but most of the audience was uncharacteristic silent ah well there are there's some issues that are really there there's not a lot of funny about them and there's some things that are very hard to satirize but the one that actually uh, did not work at all bombed totally that i did not expect i don't know if you remember uh when mitt romney put his he was accused of putting the dog on the roof of his car when he went on vacation that was like some they made a big deal out of it in the campaign that he had put his dog in a crate on the roof of the car and it was kind of a little bit of a mini scandal during the election that year. And so I wrote a song to the tune of Up on the Roof uh, <laughs> by the Drifters. And, and uh, I guess it was the, I, 
And anyway, I, and I put a grown man in a dog costume, which I thought, you know, this cannot miss. He'd be singing up on the roof in a dog costume. But you know what? There's a lot of dog lovers out there. <laughs> And that song did not work. And I can only assume that it's because too many dog lovers in the crowd. So I, you don't mess with people's dogs. I did, I did learn that. But, you know, oh, in, in even the most serious issue, there was often some way to address it. Like even, you know, like Hurricane Katrina, you know, it's a serious issue, but you can do songs about FEMA not showing up or, you know, things like that. Um, or George Bush saying, you know, Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. Um, so, so there's, there's songs that, you know, were, were tricky and uh, regret. I don't know if I'd really say that, but if the, if the audience didn't laugh, we did cut them. There's another question from the chat. And then I'll go to Kathy. Um, this question is, how did they memorize lyrics so quickly for current events? And we love the piano player at Beckman. How many piano players did you use over the years? Oh well, yeah, we had four piano players and I know who you mean, Howard. Howard was so good at laughing at something that he'd heard like, you know, for two years or whatever, a million times. He was so great at that. And he, he considered himself to be part of the show when he did that. Um, so what was the other question, part of, part of that question? How did they memorize lyrics so quickly oh. for current events? Oh, well, that was scary because people would join us in, I, I remember one time when the Pope, when the, the Pope that came from Argentina and there was, you know, all this fuss about who's going to be the new Pope and the white smoke came out at, I think about maybe noon our time on a Friday and we had a show that night and it was such a big story that we had to do something about it and we happened to have a Pope costume. So I think that performer learned that song in two hours and put it up on stage, uh, you know, <laughs> Sometimes they exploded. Sometimes people would, you know, forget the lyrics. I remember one time a, one of our performers in the middle of the song just stopped and said, you think this is easy? I just got this song this afternoon. And you know, the, the audience would give you a lot of credit for just trying to throw something up there that fast. I mean, and they didn't always forget or they didn't always remember all the words, but it was kind of funny when they didn't. Um, let's see, Kathy Waldner, um, I can't see the rest of your last name, but you have a question or comment. Go ahead. Yeah, I do. Um, Elena, I am curious to find out what has happened to the guys back, well, the three that I particularly particularly remember. There was the um, the one guy that used to do the George uh, Younger, the younger George Bush. That used yeah. to always go, <laughs> and, um, and then the other guy who had a fabulous voice and and he used to do um, oh golly I can't remember who he did and then the the woman who did Hillary Clinton a shorter blonde right probably that's probably Janet and I think I just saw her maybe a couple of weeks ago so we you know we all stay in touch um, but you know nobody's been working this past year of course and um, I guess they're going to try to you know, figure out what they do next in life. Um, you know, and none of them have life. died, right? What's that? None of them have died. Oh, no. Well, no, oh, no. Good. <laughs> oh, okay. Because <laughs> earlier you had said we've lost some of them. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, we over the years have lost a few people, you know, tragically young. But I, the people that used to come to contact that you're mentioning, no, they're still with us. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, David Falk. Yes, thank you, uh, Elena. My girlfriend and I have enjoyed uh, watching Capital Steps for the last decade at Caltech. A couple, a uh, couple things. Right, I have to say, our favorite routines were uh, the uh, judges staying alive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was we almost fell out of our seats on that one, and then. Um, being of the Jewish persuasion, we had a, a real time with um, uh, when Mel Gibson got into some trouble making some remarks that he made to a local sheriff here in Malibu. Uh, I, I've forgotten the name of the actor who came out dressed in a Hasidic outfit, and the entire audience was saying, wait a minute, what's this got to do with Capital Steps? He started to talk about it, and uh, that just had us falling in our, out of our seats also. It was great. Uh, two questions. Um, number one, what are you going to do next? And number two, 
I was wondering how these same songs, do they play the same way through audiences around the country? Does everybody take it the same way? Or do you find that different parts of the country react differently to different uh, selections? Yeah, we, well, when we traveled the country, uh, we tended to get NPR audiences because we were known from being on NPR and we've been on All, All Things Considered and of course Sarah producing our radio shows for years. And so we tended to get audiences that were A, smart and B, kind of political. And there wasn't a lot of variation, but we would try to, you know, kind of tailor it a little bit for local scandals. But, uh, uh, you know, we, we did tend to get a, you know, political cr crowd just by self-selection. Um, as for what I'm going to do next, I don't, I don't know, sit on a beach maybe. <laughs> I mean, you know, I've been doing this for 39 years and it's kind of a weird way to make a living because, you know, you get up in the morning and you don't think, is this good for the country or bad for the country? You think, is it funny and what rhymes with it? And that's kind of weird. You know, you get, you get a little strange over the years, not looking at the news like a normal person. So I think I'm looking forward to not having to figure out what's funny about certain things in the news. Thank you, and I wish you good luck in the future. Thank you, thanks for coming all those years. Thank you. Russell, do you have a question or comment? Let me unmute you. Let's see, Russell, are you able to unmute now? There okay. you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Elena, I don't know if you remember me, but I was the, the guy who always stayed year after year to take pictures of you guys, and I would give you copies of them. Yeah, right. Me? Yeah, okay. I remember uh, you, you, sure. You got the yeah, album table. So um, what I want to know is um, if I send them to the address that's on your website, will you get the pictures like, that I took last time? Oh, we, we do have contact information on our website, yeah. Okay. So you, can send, okay. you can send a message through the, yeah, through the website. That would be cool, thanks. Okay, good. I, I still got it. <laughs> Last time, you know, so I'm going to be. That's a tradition, as I recall. Yes. Yeah, you know, I appreciate you letting me do that because some people don't like pictures taken. You guys are always really nice about that, so I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, well, you, you know, it's it's it's, it's great that you do that. So. Yeah. So I'll miss you dearly, and I wish you the best of luck, and hopefully well, someday uh, we'll see each other again. Maybe. Well, thank you. We really did love coming out there every spring. I it was just a an annual kind of all right. It's spring, and we're at Caltech, and it was beautiful, and the audience was great, and we loved it. Okay. Well, thank you for everything. Thank you. Gona, how about you? I, um, I'm coming in from Santa Barbara, and although I drive down to go to some things at Beckman, I didn't drive down for Capital Steps because they came to Santa Barbara to the right. Liberia Theater. And I'm an usher there, so I can see everything for free, but I would buy a ticket so I could sit right up front for Capital Steps. It's the <laughs> only thing that I wouldn't usher for so I could hear every word. Every song. I loved it. I'm going to miss you. And I'm just wondering if you happen to recall how many years you've been coming to the Libero in Santa Barbara. Boy, I'd have to look that up, but I know it was many years. And I know that it was fun because you always had like one kind of sort of famous person in the audience there. <laughs> like I remember meeting, uh, I remember meeting Jeff Bridges there and, and you know, a couple other actors that would come and, um, it was always just fun that you know they would watch us. I've been watching, you know, I've been watching them all these years. So that was that was always a treat. And that's a beautiful little theater. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Yes. So we have a question from the chat. This is from Janine. Says, uh, I'm curious to know if you had any stories about parodies. Did you ever have problems with the original artist or publisher? Did anyone ever object? Um, Janine says, I love parodies and you're magnificent at it. <laughs> Thanks. No, we never did um, get any uh, objections over the years. In fact, some of the um, people that had, were the original authors of some of the songs came to see us. I remember at Caltech, Richard Sherman, who wrote Mary Poppins, and of course we used supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. He would come every year, every year to see us at Caltech. He was great. Um, but you know, parody has a long history in this country and um, goes way back to even, I think Yankee Doodle was the original, you know, was a parody. And the courts have been very kind to um, fair use and parodies and free speech. Great, there's another one from Kathleen that was in the chat. Um, during your song, Speaker of the House, um, Kathleen says, my husband was the only one who yelled out, Hastert, was that common that people usually didn't know who the Speaker of the House was? 
<laughs> it was. It was. We we I remember the the origin of that song because I you know Master of the House is from Les Mis and I remember saying to someone I want to write a song about Dennis Hastert called Speaker of the House. Uh, I want to write. And, and they said, well, you better write it about how nobody knows who he is. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's perfect. So we'll try it. And probably at Caltech, people didn't know who he was. But, but that was a speaker. You know, everybody knows Nancy Pelosi now. But back then, nobody knew who Dennis Astrid was. And we have a question from Alan Frisbee. Alan, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead, Alan. Alan. Alan uh, I know Alan this is a poor yes uh we we have a very we have a very poor internet connection here so i'm not sure you can hear me I can. if you can i want to thank you for bringing so much joy to uh to me and my wife and to all of the huge number of friends that we brought to caltech i'd like to apologize to all the people who are listening who couldn't get good tickets at all because you Thank bought you them very all. much <laughs> alan i remember you we saw you every year in the front three rows or whatever it was with all your friends and one year you had buttons that said that people wore that said i'm with alan frisbee and i had one of those buttons for years and i think i lost it when i moved recently <laughs> but I, I kept it for a long time that's wonderful. Um, there's another uh, question in the chat from Eileen. Will the website stay there? I think you, Eileen, you're referring to the Capital Steps website, I assume. Uh, she says, I would love to see what one of your gang might post when something happens that just can't be passed up. There have been times when something bizarre happens that I wonder how you might address it. <laughs> well, the website will be kind of in a maintenance mode for a while. Um, uh, and uh, who knows, maybe someday a reunion tour. We'll, uh, <laughs> we will never say never. But the website will be up for a long time, but it won't, we won't change it or put new songs up there. We just, it's just up there for our albums. Wonderful. Are there any other questions at all? Any burning thoughts, comments, memories? I myself am curious, what is what you're going to miss most Slash, what will you miss most about performing at Caltech? Oh, Caltech, well, Caltech, it was, it was just so fun because, you know, you think something's funny, I think something's funny, and you get out in front of, you know, a thousand people at Caltech, and we all agree it's funny and laugh together. That's just the best. You know, it was, you know, because headlines can be so serious, and you can be upset about things or anxious about things, but if everybody gets together and laughs, it's fantastic. And that's what I'll miss because, uh, you know, it was energizing and it was great and it was a connection with a lot of people. Caltech was, you know, it was really just our favorite crowd. We just loved coming out there. Michael, did you have any questions what people might still be thinking? Hope you're on mute. Let me unmute you there, Michael. Hold on, Michael. Let's see. There we go. Did go. that do it? Yep, we oh, can hear you now. Much better. <laughs> okay, good. I never muted myself, so it must have happened externally. I really would, uh, as much as anything, want to thank Elena and uh, the folks who've joined us because Elena, you were you were were so important to the uh, to the Caltech uh, audience. The fact that we could, uh, during the best of years, get to three performances of you. And then one year, somebody made a decision to cut back to two and just do a matinee in an evening. And by the time we, somebody got smart enough to say, we should really be doing three again, you'd already sold that day to Santa Luis Obispo and we couldn't pick up the, the next day's ah. uh, show of it all. <laughs> uh, because, uh, and we were also very proud that uh, the other public radio station, Sarah worked for years with KCRW, but also our local one in Pasadena, KPCC last year, was our partner in presenting you. And again, we proved that uh, there's more than enough demand for, uh, for the two shows that we did do that, that time. Um, I'm just wondering if you also notice different uh, amounts of tolerance at different times for humor in Washington. You've been there through various administrations. We're dealing uh, at times quite intimately, as you talked about going into the White House and performing at various events with elected officials. 
did you find that different ones had a different level of tolerance for being the, the butt of your humor or uh, people make fun of some of the policies and incidents that took place? Yeah, I mean, I think that it, when I first, we first started and I worked for Senator Percy, as you know, who's a, you know, a moderate Republican um, and Reagan was in the White House. It was, um, there was a whole kind of like, you know, he'd have beers with Tip O'Neill and it was all kind of, you know, bipartisan, you know, good natured humor back and forth. You could have done, we could have done our Tip O'Neill songs in front of Reagan and our Reagan songs in front of Tip O'Neill and everybody would have laughed. Um, it became over the years, and I think starting sort of with the, you know, Newt Gingrich and Clint, it, it, it became more partisan, but in recent years, it got very partisan. And there were some people, I think, who were concerned about, can I even laugh at this? And so the best compliment we would get at that point was, um, you know, I've been fighting with my friends about it, but I came to the show and I laughed and I feel better. So it was, it got a little tougher, but it got maybe more important to do it. Well, it's good to hear because uh, humor as well as the arts sometimes uh, reveals things that are not so easily done in an op-ed piece or in didactic speeches uh, in the well in the Senator House. I think we may have some more questions. Corrine, is that right? Yes, there's just a couple more in the chat. Um, curious, I, this is fun. Carol asks, what song would you have used for COVID-19? Actually, we we had a song as it sort of started to the tune of Fever by Peggy Lee about if you know if you've got fever. Um, and so we did that, and, and, but it was a, you know, the show was shut down pretty quickly after we started doing that. So, you know, over the months it would have changed. We might have done songs about hand washing when we first started and masks, and you know, but but uh, Fever was the one that we actually used. Um, and then another question, um, Brian and Marlene say, they were always amazed by what you did with a few wigs and black travel dresses. How large was your traveling prop kit? <laughs> it was, we had about maybe about uh, five like foot locker type size suitcases. And it's true, we had, you know, you had to, we had to try to find a wig. Okay, for Bernie Sanders, you try to find a wig that's as bad as Bernie Sanders here. If you can do it. So we had the prop person was really the star of the show. She could make take a perfectly good wig and mess it up so that it was like either Trump or Bernie Sanders, whichever one had more horrible hair, she could do it and make it look like that. So she was kind of the star, but we did. Yeah, you know, we traveled with you know 20 wigs and five suitcases and um sometimes i think we maybe used the hillary wig again for elizabeth warren <laughs> so just combs a little different there's another one doug says the last several months seems to offer so much material what would you do with the election audit in arizona oh. like cyber ninjas <laughs> with the ninjas <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know. We used to, actually we had a song about Arizona for many years about uh, well. Uh, well, anyway. But I oh, gosh, I haven't. I haven't figured that one out. But we um, we could do recount maybe to respect. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm seeing some more um, comments and memories, um, but not questions. Just thought I'd share them. We'll, we're all here. Um, Jenny Hines says she remembers the mixed reaction to the comedy album by Vaughn Meter satirizing President Kennedy. Um, and then Laureen says they had a chance to hear you in the 1980s. You performed at their staff's goodbye party when they worked for Congressman Jerry Patterson and he lost his election in 1984. Uh-oh, was that, a, <laughs> that's a little hard to laugh at a goodbye party, I guess, but I, I hope we did. <laughs> And then um, I'm not seeing any more questions coming. So to just value everyone's time, Michael, maybe we say our thanks and we bid Elena adieu. Thank you. I, you know, and I don't know how, whether, can I answer these comments here or are they, um, I don't know how this all works. Right um, you're more than welcome to um, write anything in the chat and we will also save it. So you can have it after if, uh, if you want. I could do it later. Okay, because I appreciate all the comments. Wonderful. Can we all give a round of virtual Before applause? Before I do my.
before I do my final goodbyes, uh, I would just like to, if Sarah Spitz, with the weak lapse between our recording and today, if, if Sarah has anything else that she wants to add, because I cannot tell this audience enough how much I appreciate the uh, Sarah Spitz, uh, one, her personal friend, but also the role that she played in making this a very interesting and exciting program for us to do. Sarah, you're still on, I trust. I am. And it was all I can say is that, it, A, it's been an honor to be here and to have been asked in the first place. B, it was always great working with you, Elena, and it was always great working with the Capitol Steps. And um, I'll miss you guys. I, I know, guess. likewise, Sarah. Thank you so much for uh, all you did for us. And stay beautiful, because you are. <laughs> you too. <laughs> And I then want to just add my thanks, not just to the two of, of you ladies for uh, giving your time and being with us for this uh, really uh, helpful and, and, and memorable experience, but I also want to thank the staff at uh, Caltech, Ed Brown, Dwayne Miles, uh, who are doing uh, the production work, uh, Kareen Shore, our house manager, Virginia Cabrera, Kara Stemmen, who are working on the uh, promotion and production issues from our office as well. And from the uh, media production office at Caltech, Leslie Maxfield and Gina Chen. And we wanna thank our sponsors, the Caltech Employees Federal Credit Union and the Friends of Beckman Auditorium. And not only do they help us do programs like this, but friends also help us do all of the science talks we do for young people. And we've got a lot of them in the can. If any of you stopped having science classes after uh, 12th grade, so that's where I go, because I learned the science that is uh, aimed at uh, those of us who went for liberal arts classes rather than uh, science classes in college. So the friends have been very helpful in that regard as well. We want to remind you that for our other events coming up, you can go to events.caltech.edu and keep tabs on things, including this Monday's Zocalo presentation, which is a part of an author series that is being done with Zocalo, a Los Angeles-based uh, lecture series. And they're interviewing Dr. Paul Nurse, who is a professor in, based in England. And he's going to be interviewed by a professor that we share at Caltech with the University of Cambridge, Magda Zernica Getz, talking about the brain. So it'll be quite, quite interesting as well. And again, my deepest appreciation because you guys are special. You were the top of the heap. There were other groups that are obviously tried to do uh, comedy and parody. I don't think anybody touched what you have been doing and have touched America the way you did. And even if it was this rarefied NPR audience that uh, followed you from town to town or was there in each one of the towns, you were touching people that uh, probably thought deeply about the way you looked at things. And who knows how much you may have influenced the way people started to think about public policy in general. So it's an important role that you played, Elena. And I know I'm speaking for those viewers who didn't have a question or didn't want to drop in a comment that just said another thank you. But on behalf of all of us at the Caltech community that have enjoyed you for nigh on 30 plus years, both on the radio and in person, a big deep thanks. Again, Sarah Spitz, thank you for what you've done, both popularize them around the country and to serve us for this program. And for the rest of you all who've been with us, our, all, our, our deep thanks as well. We look forward to seeing you next time. Good evening. Thank you.